Hello everybody and welcome to the first episode of season two of Hidden Treasures, the live show where we take you behind the scenes of the Natural History Museum in London. As always, I'm your host Connor and if you watched last month's special episodes, you'll know that today we are in the Snakes Collection, which we'll be exploring with you. Now, if you've seen the show before, you'll know the format, but if not, it's pretty simple. We're here for the next half an hour, and we're live, and it's up to you to decide what we're checking out. So if there's certain specimens you'd like to look at in the Snakes Collection, let us know in the live chat. And if there's any cabinets, doors or jars you want to close to look at or look inside, let us know in the live chat box and we'll come to as many as we have time for. I've got my phone on me, so I'm keeping track of everything that comes through. But we're also going to be joined by our museum expert scientists every week as well. And today we're going to be joined by herpetologist Dr Ian Brennan. So if you've got any questions for Ian, please pop those in the chat box as well. Now there are a few ways in which season two is going to be a little bit different from season one and that is when the episodes are coming out. They're coming out at this time which is 12.30 p.m British summer time and we're going to be coming to you live every week for the next six weeks so to make sure you're keeping on track and watching along live to get your questions and your suggestions in make sure that you subscribe to the Natural History Museum YouTube channel and hit the bell icon to be notified of when we're going live. And make sure you stick around to the end of today's episode for a sneak hint about where we're gonna be going in next week's episode. But for now, I think we should get exploring and let's meet Ian. So if you wanna follow me this way, and here we go. Hey Ian. What's good? How yeah, you doing? Well, Welcome to the bad. Herpetology Collection. Excellent. Thank you so much for having us yeah. and thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to show us around. Um, so yeah, just to kind of get started. So herpetology, what, what is it? What is that? Yeah, herpetology <laughs> is the study of reptiles, uh, reptiles and amphibians. But today we're standing in the, in the reptile collection, right. part of that collection. Um, mostly lizards and snakes, though our collection does include things like crocodiles and turtles as well. Cool. have somewhere around 100,000 specimens wow. um, and about... 50,000 snakes or something. Right, so where we're selling right now, we're absolutely surrounded by reptiles, it's really cool. Um, and, but I think to start off with, you have a mystery specimen I do. for everyone watching along. So everyone watching along, uh, we're gonna take a look at this mystery specimen. It was, uh, there was a picture on socials as well, a bit earlier on. Um, uh, but if you have any guesses for what this might be, please put them in the chat box and uh, we're gonna come back round to it at the end to figure out what it is. But would you mind pointing it out to yeah, us? Yes. So. On the, close to the end of the tail, kind of yes. just straight in from where my fingers, oh, yeah, you're going to yeah. see a kind of claw-looking uh, scale sticking out, or a structure that's sticking out. Um, and that's what our mystery, mystery item is today. Okay, I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it's uh, part of a snake's biology. Um, is that towards the end or the front of the snake? Though? End, yeah, okay, yeah. That's, right. that's the tail end. The head is down here. Okay, right. Okay, so it's near the tail end. Um, and we've actually already had some guesses in cool. uh, on socials before um, we went live today. Um, we've had quite a lot of people thinking that it might be a vestigial leg. Mm, good guess. What's a vestigial leg? Yeah, <laughs> vestigial structures are are things that are generally kind of on their way out evolutionarily. They're kind of, uh, okay. they're generally being removed or they don't really serve a purpose. Right. Um, you know, the example we always give is male nipples. Yeah. Um, right. You know, they don't do a, a, the purpose that yeah. female nipples do. Cool, so. excellent. A famously, no snakes have legs, right? Uh, no, no okay, living right. snakes have legs. But they used to be. Yeah, yeah. So snakes are limbless uh, lizards. Okay. So at some point they had to lose those limbs. Mm -hmm. And so there are what we call transitional snakes. So um, extinct species, fossil species that you can see limbs, wow. either two or, or four limbs. It would be great to get a bit more into that, like yeah. in the distinction in a little bit yeah, between of snakes and lizards. We've also had people guess that it could be a toe. I guess I that's a similar sort of yeah, yeah. thing as Same vestigial vibe. limb. Um, uh, also, we've had uh, the guesses of tooth and fang. Well, yeah. Yeah. Would that be possible to have a tooth near the tail? Uh, not so far as we know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a great guess, but yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, any like not anything can happen. But there are there are strange mutations and stuff that happen in genetics of animals. So yeah, it's like, possible, but it's I'm not, it's I'm not, not going to endorse it. <laughs> <Yeah>. as, as... <laughs> no worries. Excellent. And I see that you've also got something else 
on this trolley. It'd be great to get a closer look at that yeah, as well sure. um, before we get into other things in the collection. So what have we got here? Yeah, so I, I just brought this out because people think of snakes, they immediately think of boa constrictors and pythons, these huge, huge um, snakes. But a lot of snakes are really small and some of them are, you know, vanishingly tiny, um, including these what we call blind snakes or, or thread snakes. So right. Tiny little things, you know, they've got eyes that are covered with scales so they can't really see particularly well. Um, and tiny little mouths, you know, they're not going around eating, you know, big, big mammals or birds or anything. So it's kind of like a... That's a similar sort of life to a mole. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the same things kind of happen. Eyes get reduced, they yeah. get a bit rougher, um, and wow. they're, they're really well adapted for life on the ground. So. That's so cool. It's so small. Where, the, whereabouts are these found in the world? So they're found all over the world, um, but this specific one uh, is, is uh, an African species, I think. Um, Actually, maybe this is a South American species. They're, right. they're found across most of the continents. Um, we don't have any Ooh. in, in um, uh, the UK, but we do have some in Europe. Excellent. So. Um, just want to shout out, actually, there's a few people watching along who are very excited to see Hidden Treasures back. And I know they're long-time viewers, so thank you so much, James, and also Lemon Basil for tuning in. Like, it's really nice to have you join us again. And make sure if you've got questions for Ian or you want to see any particular snakes, just let us know in the chat box. Um, but yeah, I think let's head on to some other yep. specimens that you've got out as well. Sure. So we'll tuck that away for now, but make sure you keep your guesses coming through for the mystery specimen. We'll revisit it at the end. Um, so yeah, what else do we have here? So the other thing people, you know, really like to, to talk about with snakes is, are they venomous? Yes. Um, and yes, there's lots of, there's lots of venomous snakes. There's over 4,000 species of snakes. Um, I'm not exactly sure how many of those would be venomous, but uh, a good proportion of them. Um, and they're broken up across different groups, but here's uh, an example of um, what we call a gaboon viper. So oh, this wow. is a, a large snake from Southern Africa, um, probably the longest fangs in the world. So maybe two and a half centimeters long they can be. So wow. um, really big, big fangs. Wow. Um, and it's a it's a big snake. They that's get huge. Quite that's chunky. just the head as that's well. That's just yeah. the head, yeah. And that's you know that's the like, size of most of your hand. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. So the snake would be maybe up to a meter and a half long. Why would it need such large fangs? Yeah, that's a really good question. They um, prey on on mammals. They're ambush predators, uh, and so it's like a, a needle, big needle. Um, right. And you know, if you only need to sink the tip in to be effective, you know, having that kind of extension of the, the fang is more effective. Yeah. Um, but so, I mean, you know, mammals, it is a, like big mammals, small mammals. You know, mostly small mammals. Okay. Probably lots of rodents. Okay. And, and cool. Things like rats and, and yeah. things like that. Um, yeah. And, and next to that, we've got um, a, a relatively close, a close relative, so a puff adders. Um, so this is a whole bunch of baby puff adders that were all, you know, on the label it says 38 young from, uh, from one specimen. So this would have been 38 young puff adders that would have been birthed by a single female puff adder, um, which goes to show these big snakes can be really fecund, like have lots of young. Wow. Um, so they can be super, super fertile. And so th they were they're birth like, like live birth? Live, yeah, yeah. Right. So that's, that's actually a really interesting um, point you bring up is that um, these would have been birthed live. Um, and live birth has shown up a couple times in, uh, many times in reptiles where in mammals, you know, we have one, we're all live birth, yeah. um, except monotremes. And then uh, in birds, it's all eggs, right? Yeah. But reptiles go back and forth a lot, um, which actually is one of the reasons why you get this cool thing, which is a, a proper sea snake. Um, right. So this is an Australian species of sea snake. You can see next to its head, it's got a really wide, flat paddle tail. And part of the reason these guys have been so successful in the oceans, um, moving out into the oceans, is that they give live birth. They never need to come to land. Right. Drink water, you know, rainwater off the top of the ocean. So they just stay in the ocean their entire lives. If they ever come on land, they're either in trouble or dead. Oh that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah, because even like turtles go on land to lay eggs. Yep. And so yeah. they, they're just, that's incredible. Mm. I, yeah, I had no They've idea. Amazing. Cut that link entirely. Wow. So they only spend their time in the, in the ocean. Wow. Okay, I have 
I have one question about this, and then we've actually had quite a few. I'm being greedy. We've had a few <laughs> audience questions, but I did, yeah. while it's fresh in my mind, yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask, why is it that some snakes give birth to live young and some give birth to eggs? Is it like more advantageous to do one or the other? Yeah, so in, this, in the case of like a sea snake, it's yeah. advantageous to give live birth because it means you don't need to come to land and be vulnerable yeah. on land where yeah. you, you're not good moving yeah. around. Yeah, so they've got a big paddle that will... Like, exactly, and their belly them. scales aren't the same way as, as terrestrial. Right. Like land-living snakes have big belly scales that help them move around and these guys have um, lots and lots of small belly scales which wouldn't be useful at all yeah. on, on land. Um, so in lizards uh, and some snakes the evidence is that um, colder climates mm -hmm. if you laid an egg it would literally freeze you yeah. know like vipers in, or adders in, in the UK. Um, they go really far uh, high up in latitude. Um, so if they laid an egg, it, it wouldn't hatch. Mm. But if they gave birth to live young, they can, you know, hold the, the embryo inside until it's ready right. to come out. Okay, so it's more, you can, you can kind of time. Like, yeah, 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 you can control it a bit Amazing. more. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's That's pretty wild. That's super cool. Amazing. Mm. Um, okay, on to some audience questions. So cool. um, we've had another mystery specimen guest from James who's speculated that it might be a hook to help latch on and squeeze its prey. Whoa. Okay. I like that idea. You like that idea? I like the idea. I, cool. Thank you, I'm James. not going to comment yet, okay. but that's a cool hypothesis. Excellent, excellent. Um, and then uh, we've also got a couple of questions from Emma. And Emma's asked, what's the biggest snake that's in the museum's collection? That is a fantastic <laughs> question. We, well have, done, we have some mega-sized snakes down, downstairs in what we call our tank room, which is where this is uh, up here. We have mostly our, our small specimens, but we have all of our big things um, are, are downstairs. And there's some absolutely monster uh, <laughs> reticulated pythons, some huge king cobras, you know, yeah. up over four meters long that wow. are, are in very, very large um, glass, glass jars. I'm not sure what the biggest one is, but that's a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'll have to come back and get okay, you an answer yeah. for that. We'll come yeah. back to you on that one, Emma. And yeah, like the, there's, there's obviously multiple places then where the snakes are stored as well here yeah. in the museum. So if you want to see more of the snakes, let us know. And we've got future episodes and seasons coming up. So Emma also asks of you, what's your favorite snake in the collection? Wow. And I wonder if there's something in here that you can, you can show us. That yeah, look, cool. I'll, I'll show you something cool. That's, a, you know, that's like asking who your favorite yeah, child yeah. is, kind of. <laughs> but um, I did set something up earlier. Cool. Oh, excellent. Fantastic. This is probably one of the coolest snakes, I, probably one of my favorite snakes. Um, so this is Chrysopelia, uh, what we call the flying tree snakes. Um, so these guys live up in the trees, so they're really long and skinny and fast. Um, but when they need to get out of the trees fast, um, what they can do is launch themselves out spread out their ribs like little wings and then control the just like yeah, yeah. spread out like if you sucked in your your tummy as far as you could you know how it has that feeling of spreading your ribs out yeah it's the same thing um and they can you know they don't fly fly but they can control their descent pretty well um right. so they become real pancake uh thin and and wide and and they catch the air on the way down which is you know Snakes on a plane, you know, yeah. they beat them to the idea. Yeah. No idea is original. <laughs> That's so cool. So it's like it shows like we looked at the sea snake and now we've got a snake that can glide through the air. Like yeah, yeah. They, they have like between the different species, they've kind of and the, and the snake that lives on the ground. Yep. They've mastered a lot of different habitats between S them. Snakes have done pretty much everything you can do and without limbs, which is you know, what makes wow. them so special. It's so cool. Yeah. Um, I've actually got a question here because like, mm. we've had a look a lot, at, we've had over the episodes, we've looked at a lot of um, uh, specimens stored in like these spirit containers in these yep. jars. And a lot of them are quite faded just due to age and stuff. But I've noticed that, especially this one here, if maybe mm. we can pull this out a little yeah, bit. Yeah, of course. Um, you can see its pattern really, really well. Mm. As, and why is it that on these reptiles, maybe just these snakes, that they, they preserve the patterns really well, even while they're in like this spirit. Yeah, some of the, the pigments um, 
are more kind of color fast, um, but some pigments do break down faster. So, right. so in life, this would have this snake, this um, emerald tree boa, would have been you know really bright grass green color. Right. Um, but that yellow pigment, xanthan, breaks down faster, right. um, and so you end up with a kind of tainted aqua -y blue color instead. Um, and that will continue to to fade. UV breaks down um, pigments as well. So older specimens that you know had. Uh, you know, light coming in through a window, mm. or they sat on somebody's shelf too long, who knows? Um, those ones will look a bit uh, crappier too, so. Um, <laughs> That's so cool. Part of it is age, part of it is how they were preserved. Because this one's still really bold as well. With the yeah, black yeah. Colors. It's also, these two are both real high contrast things. You know, you got blacks and, and really demarcated white um, splotches, so it, it makes it look nicer. Yeah. <laughs> to, to know. <laughs> Back to some of the audience suggestions and questions. We've had a couple more mystery specimen guesses. Claire has speculated that it might be a reproductive organ. Whoa. And that also lines up with um, one of the suggestions we had in um, earlier before we went live. Someone speculated it could have been a snake's penis. Oh, as yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah. Just so, on the outside, hanging yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, could just be there, yeah. <laughs> right. um, and uh, then also, some people have speculated that it could be some sort of claw use for mating as mm. well. So very interesting things. We'll reveal all at the all end. The um, so thank you so much for this comment, Max, uh, who said it's amazing to see behind the scenes. Um, and they would quite like to see a yellow green tree python specimen. I mean, yeah. do we have one of those we that do. we can show? We do. We, we've got so something we've similar got a, already. So we've got an emerald tree boa, yeah. which is the South American version of, of what you're talking about. Right. Um, if you want me, I can duck yes, in yeah, just yeah, yeah. and we'd, we can grab Please out a do. green tree yeah, python. Yeah, that would be great. And then you can see how similar these things Excellent. are. Excellent. Yeah, that would be really, really cool. So Excellent. I'm just going to duck in right here. Um, and just while you're grabbing that, um, we've also had a question from Lizzie. Um, who's asking, are snakes less vulnerable to climate change if they like the heat? Concentrating on that. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I will, very uh, heavy glass shell, so we'll maybe we'll save that one for when I'll it's put these things, brought out. I'll hand you oh, well, one. Oh, your hands are full as well. Uh, you hold on to this one. <laughs> yes, for I'll sure. I'll hold on I'll to this one. one. You want to cool. put Should them bring here? them back, yeah, back yeah. over here? Sounds good. Yeah, and then we can get a nice good look at those. Cool. So the, the climate change question is a, is a great question. Um, the thing about um, reptiles and, and amphibians, because they're ectotherms and they're, they're reliant on, um, uh, on the heat from the atmosphere, um, they're actually really vulnerable to, to changing climate. Um, because they don't have control, they don't have the ability to regulate their own body temperature. Um, so things, you know, particularly things that live on mountains, if it gets hotter, they've got nowhere else to go um, up uh, to, to be able to regulate that temperature. And so they're, they're kind of screwed. Um, so they're, um, and, and also in, in places like in deserts, where it's just going to get drier, you know, a lot of these things are living on the fringes of what is possible mm. in the physiological world. So getting drier and hotter makes it even less hospitable for them. So right. um, they're also really vulnerable. Mm. So we pulled out, um, I'll, I'll just reorder these, sorry. Um, we pulled out uh, two green tree pythons um, in addition to the emerald tree boa that we already have. Um, so all of these live in trees. Um, really similar snake in that they've got long tails, long uh, fangs, um, and they're bright green. Um, the green tree python lives in uh, northern Australia, New Guinea, and Indonesia. Um, and when they're young, they're born either yellow or orangey red. Um, and they, wow. they change color to, to end up in this green state. Um, which, Why do they change color? I, you know, the idea might be that it, it has to do with um, Camouflage, you know, they might look more like a dead leaf or something on a branch when right. they're quite small. Um, and then they blend in. they're living down on the ground? They're or? living in, in kind of low bits of foliage, like right. in shrubs and, and trees. Um, but the wild thing is that these two snakes, the python and the boa, have, you know, they're separate evolutionary groups. Um, but they, the, the emerald tree boas do the same thing where they're young or either yellow or orangey, oh, orangey red. And so it's just one of those amazing uh, convergences in, in nature. We've seen quite a lot of those on this series. Oh, well, on series one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when we were looking at the mammal collection with um, Nasty Cooper, we were looking at tenrecs from Madagascar. Yeah, yeah. 
But then they were like kind of like there were some that looked like hedgehogs and stuff yeah. despite being completely separate. So that's so we've got that again here. That's so fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, it pops up a lot. Um, I guess it's like if it's a really advantageous kind of adaptation, then it's it's popular. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. If it works, it works. Yeah. Um, it's also you know maybe there's limitations on how you know be it morphological or physiological or whatever on what you can look like you know yeah. you're not going to have an arm growing out of your head yeah. like kind of things like that yeah so, so just by sheer chance evolution kind of ends up in the same place so we've had a question through from lemon basil um it's actually no from from lemon basil's daughter mm. um who wants to know um if snakes can swim yeah. now we saw a sea snake earlier yeah, yeah, that yeah. had a paddle just for swimming yeah so definitely when you rewatch this video check that one out but as well as those sea snakes, can other snakes swim? Yeah, um, I would venture that all snakes can swim. Um, something about their locomotion, um, the way you know they move like snakes, yeah. um, is really good for swimming. So even those little, like that little blind snake that looked like a spaghetti before, <laughs> if you threw that thing in water, it'd take off swimming across the surface. Um, and then there's you know snakes that only live in water, like the sea snake. Um, there's also some other things called file snakes or elephant uh, trunk snakes. Um, they live exclusively in water. Um, yeah. So yeah, don't can... bother coming out ever. <laughs> that's that's so cool. Mm. Um, and actually, on that note, I had a question. Um, in terms of we we looked at the sea snake that had a tail with the kind of like um, what would you call that? The, the, the kind of big flat part. Yeah, paddle. Yeah. A paddle. Yeah, like yeah. Pad okay, yeah, yeah. cool. Like the paddle on its tail. Do snakes have tails? Because they're all just like yeah, yeah, yeah. skin. Yeah. Like, where does their tail start? Yeah, this is the the <laughs> debate about like you know if a snake was wearing a tie, where yeah, would it, yeah. you know where does it go? Um, so their their tail actually starts, you know how we define it. Their tail starts um, where their cloaca is. Okay. Um, their cloaca is uh, a joint opening for um, passing uh, waste. So right. instead of doing wheeze and poos through different holes, they have a single, um, a single opening called the cloaca. Um, so everything after the cloaca is tail. Um, everything before that is either trunk or head. Right. Or neck. But distinguishing between trunk and neck can be difficult. OK. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, man. Because, they, yeah, they just, yeah. It's hard to tell mm. if you're not. If you just see a snake and you just see a head and then a really and a long part. Yeah. Snake and a tail, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, going back to Lemon Basil, so, um, so they're actually, uh, Lemon Basil and the daughter are actually both on holiday. Cool. And they're wondering, I'm assuming maybe UK based, if they should be um, looking out for snakes in the water in the UK or is it too cold? What's the kind of sitch? Yeah, you don't really um, you don't really get many snakes in the water here. There's not many snakes, period. In, yeah. in the UK. I wanted to ask um, actually on that. Like, mm -hmm. I know there are snakes in the UK, but like, yep. I've never seen one personally. Yeah, like, um, there's adders. There's even you know adders are a viper, so they're a venomous snake. Um, there's even adders you can find in the city of London. Mm -hmm. um, there's adders, grass snakes, um, and then there's um, some other. There's a few introduced things too. Oh, but, wow. Um, yeah. Like by accident? Like. Yeah, hard to know if it was like pets that escaped or were, you know, let out or, um, you know, just proximity to mainland Europe means right. that those things are going to happen. Okay. Coming across. And just on that note about like people looking out for snakes and stuff, mm. is there um, any kind of like major myths about snakes that you'd be keen to like dispel while we're here live? Oh, yeah, there's heaps. Uh, the first one that always drives me bonkers is people being like, they're slimy, you know. <laughs> they're not slimy, they're actually very dry. Right. Um, because their scales are, are quite rigid and they're very good at not losing moisture. Um, so they're, they're very dry. They're very smooth, which can give you the, the feeling that they're slimy, but right. they're really dry and, and, and yeah, they feel great. I wonder where that crazy. came from. Maybe because like earthworms are slimy. And yeah. They, they also have no legs. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. yeah or eels or something. Yeah, yeah. People also say, ask or, or say that snakes are deaf. Um, oh, right. 
uh, it's true their ears are designed differently. They don't have the same bones in their ears that um, a lizard or we have. You know, almost, most vertebrate animals have three bones in their ears and they've, snakes have kind of changed that by leaning one of these bones just against their skull. So they just kind of hear through their skull oh instead. Goodness, that's so cool. Um, but um, they're not deaf. They can hear both through vibrations to the ground, which is how people kind of think about it. But they can also, there was a paper that came out really recently which um, tested if they can hear through air, and they can. So they respond to, okay. to sound through air as well. Right. Which means, I it got covered in the news like, snakes can hear you scream. <laughs> so yes, they'll hear you scream and they'll probably be screaming too. Yeah, they'd be internally. quite scared of that, yeah. 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 Um, and just on that note, talking about like sensing and stuff like, what, why do they flick their tongues out? Why are their tongues uh, forked Yeah, well? yeah, great question. Um, so snakes use their tongue as a, a kind of olfaction. So this is mm -hmm. how they, they learn a lot about their environment. Um, so the tongue is forked, they flick it out, um, and they bring it back into the mouth, and each side of the tongue goes into a separate little hole in the roof of their mouth um, that gets analyzed uh, for you know, picking up molecules of potential prey items or predators. Um, and the advantage of having it forked means if you have more of those molecules on your right than on your left, you can say that that thing you're worried about or interested in is probably on your right instead of your left. Right. Um, so they, they flick their tongues to learn about their environment, okay, basically, cool. which is really useful. Lots of lizards do the same thing. Um, either, you know, uh, uh, monitor lizards and goannas, they have a big long forked tongue, they do the same thing. Um, and then lots of harmless lizards, little lizards, uh, do it as well to mimic snakes, so they look a little tough. <laughs> That's quite funny. Mm. Um, on that note about mm. lizards and snakes, yeah, I yeah. think there's some other specimens you like to show us. Yep. Um, so let's head on to that, just over here. Um, so you have one, two, three, four, five specimens. So we've been talking for a while now, and you should probably be a specialist on snakes. So okay. I've put out five <laughs> things here. Yeah. Um, the important thing to know is that snakes are, are lizards. They're just one group of limbless lizards. They lost their legs. But lots of different lizards have lost their legs through you know, the 200 million years they've been around. Um, so here's a smattering of snakes and lizards that have also lost their legs. I won't tell you how many there are, but you okay. can guess, and I don't know how you want to do it, but... Yeah, okay, so we're going to go through and figure out which one is a lizard and which one is a snake, basically, sure. okay. Yeah. And everyone else watching at home, make sure we're coming towards the end after this, in which we're going to reveal the mystery specimen. So if you have any last minute guesses, get those in before Ian reveals what it is. Um, so yeah, let's have a look here at these, and so, Right, so let's, let's, go, let's go from this side, <laughs> sure. shall we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go from this side. So that one's quite smooth. It looks a lot like the one we saw earlier. It does, yeah. So I'm going to say snake. Yeah, very well done. Okay. Yeah, that's another blind snake. So it's a slightly bigger one. No limbs. Okay. Really short tails. Excellent. Fantastic. Next one. This one. Now this one I see, it actually has really quite rough, almost like spiky mm. scales. And I feel like snakes generally speaking, have quite smooth, like as you said earlier, they're quite smooth. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say lizards. Yeah, yeah, right answer for the wrong reasons. Then. Oh no! <laughs> you, get, you get snakes that have really rigid, rough scales. Yeah. Um, but that is, uh, uh, or sorry, snakes. But that is a, a lizard, you're right. So okay. this is a, a limbless um, cordylid. So this is a South African lizard. Um, wow. You can actually see the tiny little legs, maybe, um, hanging on the side. Oh, They've wow. lost their front limbs, but kept tiny little back flaps. Wow. Which okay. is pretty wild. <laughs> so I've got, I've got two so yep. far. Yeah, yeah, two for two. You're pretty smashing it. Oh, my goodness. This one is, where, where is the head? Yeah, around the head one? is around this side. Okay, let you me, can turn let it if you want to look. look. Oh, wow. Okay, I feel like this is kind of similar to the first one. I'm going to go snake? Yeah, this is, that was the trick. Yeah, this is a lizard. This oh. is another one of these completely limbless group of lizards. Um, this is an amphisbanian. Wow. Um, so they're another underground living. It's got kind of a shovely little snout that they move to, uh, use to move uh, a soil around. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Right. Failed that one. Next yep. one. <laughs> We've got some of the patterns still visible on this one. It's really quite nice. This is really hard. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna go. 
I'm just gonna stick with, I'm gonna go snake? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This is, this is a snake, another boa. Um, That's uh, so hard with that one. Yeah, yeah. There's, you know, not much to work with. Um, you see why, you know, lots of, of groups have kind of converged on yeah. a similar style of limblessness is, is advantageous. And then finally, we've got another one that looks a bit more kind of rough, but as you said, that's also a bit of a trick for me, <laughs> so I'm going to go for snake again. <laughs> yeah, so that's a, a good guess, but that is a lizard. <laughs> okay. Not only is it a lizard, it's a gecko. That's a gecko? That's a gecko. So you've got... What a, is it? Sticky fingers? A exactly. <laughs> no sticky fingers, but they do lick their eyes. Oh my this goodness. is a Burton's limbless lizard from, from uh, Australia. Wow. Um, so this is, a uh, this is as snaky as you can get as a lizard without being a, a snake. So they only eat other lizards. Wow. They eat little geckos and skinks and stuff. Um, so they're totally specialized to be as snaky as you get. That's super cool. Mm. So, all right, I've got three out of five. You That's did really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get the honorary herpetologist gold star. I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah. So just when generally speaking, um, we'll be wrapping up kind of soon. So I've got a couple more questions mm -hmm. for you and then we'll reveal the mystery specimen. Um, so with this one here and like the other, which one was the other lizard? This one. Yep. And this one. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So for folks that... Um, that are out and about, is there an easy way to identify yeah. the difference or is, do you have to be a herpetologist? It can, it can be really tough. One of the advantages um, for lots of limbless uh, lizards is that you'll see an ear hole. Um, snakes do not have external ear holes, like it'll have a scale across mm. the, the surface and skin. So you won't, um, you won't see ears on a snake. Um, it depends where you are, too. Right, um, okay. You know, the UK is a funny one because you've got uh, um, slow worms, and slow worms are just legless lizards. They're not snakes, but you also have snakes. Um, there's other places like um, where I grew up in, in New York, New Jersey, there's, oh. um, we don't have any limbless lizards. <laughs> so they're all snakes. <laughs> you, you can be pretty confident cool. that it's a snake. Um, and yeah, the, the limb flaps thing. If you're close enough to see, um, they'll have, sometimes they have limb flaps. Would not um, recommend getting that close. No, though. no, no, not if you don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then snakes, no snakes have eyelids. Um, they have a, right. a clear scale called a spectacle or a brill, um, and so they can't blink. Um, right. So that'll help you with some lizards, but not all of them. Cool. Legless lizards, yeah. All right, there you go. Um, and well done to Lemon Basil and Daughter, who got three out of five right as well. Well done, so yeah, yeah. Very, very well. Yeah, yeah. Um, Excellent. So I think um, we've, oh, this question's great, actually. Before sure. we get to the yeah. specimen, Lizzie wants to know what made you want to study snakes in the first place? Good question. Uh, you know, you get that, get that question a lot. I think part of it, I, I loved animals, so I, you know, went through the dinosaur, dinosaur phase, also had a big shark phase. Nice. But with reptiles, um, like the area I grew up in, like the suburban area, we didn't really have any reptiles. Like, we had very few reptiles, and I think that was kind of one of the things that drew me to it, was a they seemed exotic, exotic and, yeah. yeah, like warm climbs and stuff. Um, and now I appreciate the ones that, that I did have around home, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's hard to pin one thing down. Yeah. They're just too cool. They are really cool. Mm. And we've seen a lot of cool ones. So I think we I'll should check that. out the mystery specimen. Yeah, yeah let me yeah. go grab that. Excellent. So yeah, so just while Ian's grabbing that mystery specimen, I'll let you know what next week episode is going to be all about. So we'll be in the Angela Marmot Center, which is the museum's identification center. And we're going to be seeing some really cool things there, but stick around to the end to figure out what we're going to be looking at. So here is our mystery specimen again. If we bring that around. It's going to look just in there. Excellent. So will you please do the honor of revealing what this is? <laughs> sure. So, so this uh, mystery object is uh, what we call a cloacal spur. Um, so it's a, a, a large kind of scale that sits on the end of the femur in boas and pythons. Um, and the use or why it exists um, is a bit up in the air. We have some ideas. Um, we've seen some things. Um, they're more pronounced on males, so that's a big hint in, in what it's used for. Um, we've seen the males um, kind of 
in ritual combat, they'll use these to kind of gouge each other or grapple with one another. Um, but we also think it might be, it's probably used in courtship. Um, so males can use them to kind of stroke and tickle the females um, while they're leading up to, to, um, to uh, uh, you know, snake sex. Yes. Um, yeah, no beating around the bush. Yeah. Um, and uh, they can, the, one of the, th the thoughts there is that it might help them to feel for where the actual um, cloacal opening is. Um, you know, they don't have limbs, so they got to do this all with their trunk and tail. Yeah. Um, so having a little... Um, claw to feel it out might help. Excellent. So there you go. I mean, that is super weird. <laughs> it's, it's weird. Yeah, yeah. And like, I, it's also interesting that it's still kind of a bit up in the air as to what it could be. Yeah. But yeah, no, that's that's super cool. And actually, there was a couple people that guessed something like that. They said yeah, there it were. could be used for those sorts of purposes. Like, not prey in this case, not a hook for prey. No, no, no. A hook for other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah for yeah. other things. Yep. Super cool. I think actually there's one, one more yes. thing I've got for you that's, that goes with this, which is those, those um, cloacal spurs, there's one on each side of the body in the same way that snakes also have penises, one on each side of the body. So they have a thing called a hemipene. So they have two, two hemipenes. Um, on opposite sides. On, on opposite sides of the body. You know, they've got a left and a right one. These things are held inside their body, and then when they get you know, turned on, when they get a little rowdy, they come out like uh, an inside-out glove. Oh, my goodness. And it gets weirder, <laughs> though, because some of them have these crazy spines and, and hooks on them, too. So once Whoa. they're locked in courtship um, and inside the female, they can hold on with them so they're not getting pushed off by some other rival male right, or, or okay. whatever. Wow. Yeah, so it's... Uh, it's a strange world snakes live in. Yeah, it sounds like it for sure. Yeah. Um, I think maybe on that note as well, we've kind of come to all we have time for. Um, sounds good. So thank you so much, Ian. Thank it's you. Been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for coming around and um, talking snakes. And Emma and James say thank you so much for a great show as well. Cheers. Excellent. So I'll leave you to your research. Thank sounds you. Sounds good. Thanks. <laughs> and thank you so much, everyone who tuned in and watched today's episode. And make sure that you stick around for next week's episode as well, which is coming out the same time. 12.30 p.m. British summer time. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we're in the museum's identification centre, the Angela Marmont Centre, and we'll be unboxing some specimens that the public has sent in for the museum to identify. So that's going to be really, really exciting. Uh, but we'll also be exploring some collections in there that anyone can come and visit as well. So that's going to be really, really cool. So make sure you check out that episode. Um, and make sure that you head to our socials on Twitter and Instagram to let us know what you want to see more of in the future, um, in future episodes of Hidden Treasures. Um, and or feel free to leave a comment below this video or in the chat box if you're watching live. Um, and as always, if you enjoyed watching, make sure you subscribe to the Natural History Museum YouTube channel um, and hit the notification bell icon as well uh, so you know when we're going live with the rest of Hidden Treasures and when the rest of our great content comes out. And if you missed season one of Hidden Treasures, you can actually catch up with all of that in the playlist on our YouTube channel as well as the special episode we did last month with Erica McAllister in the Fly Collection and climate activist Mitzi Janelle Tan as well. So make sure you watch that. Um, but for now, we look forward to seeing you next week and for the rest of this season. Um, but that's all we have time for. So thank you very much for watching and see you next week. <laughs>